Mr. Eli, thanks for coming on the podcast. Hey, Mr. Brush, how you doing today? <laughs> I'm very, very good. <laughs> um, we were talking before. Good to see you, man. We were we were talking before um, we hit record here. Tell tell me a little bit about where you're from um, and your sort of, I guess, the gist of what you're doing as a game developer. Sweet. So if you don't mind, I'm gonna probably just run it back just so everyone can know. Yeah. yeah so yeah. I've been in game development for about uh, ten years. I've been doing it full time since like 2020 ish. Uh, I've been on and off because, you know, I, I went to college uh, and I was just doing, I went to community college to save money. Uh, my name's Eli Brewer. I don't know if I mentioned that. And uh, I run an indie studio called Treefall Studios. Uh, I mostly make console video games, but I also release games on Steam. And um, I was just going to college and just going to save money at community college. I was going to transfer to university. I took one game development class just because I saw that they had it at my community college and was like, oh, let's see if I enjoy this. Because, you know, I grew up playing video games. I never thought that I could actually make them. Yeah. And uh, so I took the class. And I was like, dude, I'm sold. This is super fun. And I did a two year degree in simulation and game development. And then after that, I did a four year degree in business. So like while I went oh, to wow. college, yeah. So I um, was kind of like working on the indie thing. I kind of noticed in my class, you know, like everyone wanted to get a job at like, you know, Epic Games or something like that, you know, somewhere or some far off, you know, AAA studio. And, you know, my skill set is kind of average and most of the people in there were just kind of average. So I was thinking like, uh, you know, I don't know if, you know, this is really going to work out. So I'm like, yeah. I kind of want to do the indie thing, make my own games, you know, try to do some of my dreams, that kind of thing. So I kind of did some small time stuff. It was pretty, you know, pretty bad uh, yeah. back in the day. And then um, I went to college. I released a, a game called The Letter. I don't know if you've heard about it. No, like I heard you talking infamous. about it earlier today, like when we were talking on Discord. I, I want to hear yeah. that story because it seems like you got wrecked. Uh Oh, we'll go. Oh, we'll go into it. <laughs> By the way, if you're like me and you always dreamt of making an indie game as a full-time job, I have a free webinar below that goes into exactly how to make six figures with just a demo. I was just like you for years. I thought I had to make a game in its entirety before getting a paycheck, but there's actually three ways to make six figures before even finishing your game. I've done this multiple times, so check it out below if you do want to go full-time indie. And thanks for watching. It's kind of like, um, it was kind of like, you know, it wasn't shovelware to me. It's basically like, imagine a 19 year old or even 18 year old, I think is when I first started. Imagine your student project, but somehow you got to publish on Wii U and I didn't know it was bad. You know, I was kind of a sheltered kid. I wasn't really on the internet, you know, growing up. I didn't know how mean people could be. And I just got it on the Wii U and basically the press got a hold of it and kind of was like, this is the first shovelware on Nintendo. Oh, <laughs> and I was geez, like, oh, you were the first, what? huh? According to them, you know, they thought I was ruining the quality of the eShop. That Who wrote kind of this? Thing. Um, uh, it was all over the place. It's actually, it was featured in, it was, this was 2014. Uh, it was featured in a Watch Mojo video for the top 10 worst games of 2014. They Bro. only have a clip. They didn't actually, um, so if you, I don't know, I wish I would have found it beforehand so I could send it to you. Because uh, it's just a clip of footage. They didn't actually give it into the top 10. I don't even know if it makes the honorable mentions. Yeah. But it was featured. Um, Kyle Bossman, do you know who he is? No. Uh, uh, he runs a channel now on YouTube. He used to be a guy at Game Trailers. And he made a video about how it was like destroying the eShop. And it, it got like 80,000 views in like the first like day. And I was like, what is happening? It was uh, Destructoid and Joystick. A lot of those websites okay. kind of like shut down. This was 2014? At this point. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I'm looking at, and uh, this is kind of relevant, just a side tangent. Uh -huh. I'm looking at Alien Isolation, which uh -huh. is kind of, people love it now. They love that game. Yeah. Now. IGN gave it a five. And that was in 2018, <laughs> yeah. I believe. No, yeah. no, 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 no. 2014. That's why I looked it up. Yeah. Same freaking year. Yeah. The press... Screw the press. I'm sorry. They I mean, they they write so yeah. many bad articles just because, just to get a freaking headline. Yeah. And what they do is they I destroy know. these studios' reputation. I'm pretty sure Alien yeah. Isolation got wrecked because of that review. Yeah. And then they set the standard, yeah. and so all the other outlets write the same sort of thing. When in reality, yeah. Alien Isolation was a great game, at least in my opinion. Yeah. And so my point is, to is be that fair, the the press the press has this yeah. thing 
where they write bad, they give bad reviews sort of to subvert expectations, you know? Yeah, and yeah. it sounds like they they wrecked you when maybe they could have given you a slap on the wrist. I don't know. But I don't yeah. know. Well, see, in my opinion, to be fair, it's the game's not really good or anything. It gained a cult following. It's like basically a first person, like, you know, like an hour long experience horror narrative walking sim basically but i'm like bro i'm like 19 years old and this is like a student yeah. project and they're treating it like and i charge a dollar 99 for it and they're treating it like it's a uh you know some triple a company or something like that yeah um so i did that and then i went to business school and uh i kind of stopped working on games i actually quit my job from the letter because i, I learned the lesson that all ba- all press is good press oh yeah even though that they were uh even though they're trashing it, tons of people bought it. Yep. And at the time, I was working at like a bowling alley, and I was living at home and going to community college, and I was making like seven fifty an hour. And like the first day, <laughs> I made like just off one day, I just like logged in to see the sales, and it was like more than maybe two or three months of my minimum wage job in yes. like a single day, and I was like. Oh, I'm done with this. Yep, I did. Dude, <laughs> I like, same thing just, happened for me. I was I was selling shoes yeah. at a shoe store, and mm-hmm. uh, I made twenty five thousand dollars off of a flash game. Um, oh yeah, yeah. And I, I was like, I'm gonna quit. <laughs> and so I just yeah, quit. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's great. So feeling. I did that, and then I I tried doing the full time thing for a little while. Then I went to college. And then I just basically stopped working on games for like a couple of years. Yeah. You know, posted a video here and there. Like I dropped out like one Wii U game like in 2017, something like that. Just some side project stuff. Yeah. You know, while I was going to college, I met my wife, you know, then we got married and all that kind of stuff. And then, uh, and then I, I worked some business jobs like right after, but I was still doing the game stuff, you yeah. know, kind of on the side. Yep. And then about ni- 2019, 2020, I was like, all right, you know, I'm feeling like, I still want to give this business a shot. I yeah. want to grow it to full time, you know, kind of numbers. So I'm going to, you know, go a little bit harder because my PlayStation stuff had started, you know, picking up. I was on Wii U originally, and, you know, that kind of died and switched out for the Switch. And then um, I started doing PlayStation. And then, yeah, so I've been full time for the last couple of years, uh, basically just doing full time uh, video game releases. I do YouTube, but it's just kind of, yeah. you know, me chatting <laughs> well can we like, can we talk about youtube because you and i were going to talk about youtube we were talking about it before the yeah. call and i remember telling you i yeah. said let's hang hang yeah. on let's not let's not spoil our conversation let's talk about this during the podcast yeah. so yeah. and again you get the final cut here so if there's something you say in this conversation we can cut it but i just want to say let's keep it all bro <laughs> <laughs> i just want to say that the cool. youtube game dev world mm-hmm. and this might be my fault because I, I, I teach about it. But the YouTube game dev world is getting a little spooky because random non... Well, game devs who are not profitable, which it's okay. It's okay that game devs aren't profitable. That's totally fine. It's a difficult industry, right? Mm-hmm. But there are game dev YouTubers who are giving advice about how to sell games and they're not, they're not really making money from their games. Mm-hmm. And... I wanted to know if you had any thoughts on that. Um, Dude, do I? Is it, does it bother yeah. you? Because every time I'm on YouTube, I see yeah. all these videos about how to make games or how to sell games. And I'm like, this mm-hmm. is scary because I'm worried that people are going to watch my videos and think Thomas is giving advice too. And he doesn't make money from games. He makes money from YouTube. And I'm like, no, 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 no. Hang on. I make money from my games. It's a separate business. And then I have my educational yeah. YouTube channel where I teach about that. And it's mm-hmm. it's getting the, the waters are getting muddy on YouTube. I'm curious if you have any thoughts on that. I mean, we could spend probably the whole podcast talking about <laughs> just this. <laughs> you know, it's crazy because all right, just a little background, like I hate social media, like I do. And you know, in some sense, I like it. Like the old days of social media, like, you know, my YouTube channel is kind of raw. I've been doing it for 10 years and I never tried to do the game dev space. I would just like film myself with junky cameras, screen record and be like, here's what I'm working on. Here's my dev log, you know, for years and years. And it was just about like trying to build an audience 
for my games. And I talk about this with a lot of my friends, you know, because I run a, a Discord. Um, it's a Treefall Studios Discord, but now it's full of, you know, game developers who've like found my channel and stuff and they're trying to get like beginner advice, that kind of thing. Yeah. So I get a lot of it, um, like, uh, I talk to a lot of people and see what their experience is starting YouTube. And basically most of the people who are starting YouTube, um, like people just click on the videos. Like when you're talking about yeah. advice or you're talking about money or like if you pull up my channel, for instance, you know, I've got like almost 2000 subscribers, which is, you know, relatively small, but all my videos talking about how to start a studio, how to, how much money I made, um, you know, this is what you need to do for your, your indie game. Those have 20,000 views, yep. 15,000 views or whatever. And I put out a devlog talking about my game. And I'm like, I've got my core followers of like 100 to 150 people who are like, yeah. dude, the game is awesome. So it's like, if you think about it that way, and you got a bunch of small time people who are starting out who want to be like you, you know, they want mm -hmm. to have a big channel. They want to have, you know, full-time income. It's like almost, I mean, it, it might be hard for you to think about it this way because like you've been in the space so long, yeah. you've had an audience for so long. You know, a lot of the other big guys, you know, like uh, you've talked about it on your channel a bunch. Um, some of the other game developers who are big, you know, like they have an audience. It's like if you were starting out from scratch, like let's say if you were starting out today in 2024 yeah. and you had zero followers, you know, if you just post a video about your game, the only way you go viral is if you're like super lucky or if yep. your game is just unbelievably out there. And Choo -choo not Charles. everyone wants to, yeah, but not everyone wants to make a game like that. Yep. You know, you know, in my instance, like I'm making games that I just, one that I can make skills wise because yep. like I'm the solo developer. Yeah. And then like two stuff that I find fun, you know? So it's like, if you just want to make fun games, you know, you might have an audience out there and there might be a big enough audience for you to go full time with it. But is that audience just going to find you if you're just talking about your game on YouTube? Probably not. Hmm. So I feel like most people are trying to do kind of like, you know, like, oh, I need to put on this persona of yeah. like, I'm super successful. Here's my studio. Yeah. This is what I do. All this kind of stuff. Because those videos get clicks. And it's all about the algorithm. It's all about like how to drive traffic to your yeah. channel. Yeah. But then it's like they've never shipped a game. If they do ship a game, they might not talk about how much money it actually makes. Yeah. Because, you know, in my experience, you know, especially even for me, like my Steam games, you know, they're, they don't make any money. Yeah. Um, I mean, a little bit, but n not a whole lot. And it's like when you look at most game developers, everyone says, you know, ship your games on Steam. They make a ton of money. Yeah. But, you know, to, to do the Steam thing, you've got to have an audience. you got to have enough wish lists. Yep. You know, you've got to have a, a very marketable product. Um, you know, I'm sure you're familiar with, uh, I think his name is Chris Zukowski. Oh, yeah, for sure. Um, and, and Chris has yeah, done, yeah. side note, Chris has done the right He's, he's created the right target market because he's doing exactly what I'm doing in the sense of he teaches marketing of games, right? And how, mm -hmm. how to sell games and how to make money. The difference is, is yeah. that he's not also a game developer. And so he's, he's a marketing yep. guru, right? Mm -hmm. And what happens with me is that people are like, Thomas, it's so, it makes, I shouldn't care. It makes me sad though, because people are like, Thomas isn't a game developer, he's a YouTuber. So he's, he's manipulating yeah. and I'm like, I'm not manipulating. I've got a business on one side over here and I've got a business over here. I've got an educational mm -hmm. platform on YouTube. And then I also run a game studio called Atmos games. And we're currently signed with 3d realms and we're making a huge, almost double a triple shooter uh, or double a shooter. And yeah. what's happening in the game dev sphere, sorry to derail here, but what's happening is that oh, it's okay. people see that and they go, well, I'm going to do the same thing that like Thomas and other YouTubers are doing, and I'm gonna talk about mm -hmm. money and mm -hmm. pretend that that's coming from my games. And it's like, it's mm -hmm. it's not. And- or, No, yeah. So it, it feels disingenuous, and so it waters down the whole industry or the whole YouTube game dev yeah. sphere. Um, so anyway, is that kind of what you're talking about? Yes, it is. I, I forgot what I was gonna say about Chris. It's kind of like, I was gonna say something about Steam marketing. You know, oh, like, sorry. He's got a thing. 
Yeah, he's got a. I, I'm, I'm going to go back to it, but he's got a point about like what games do well and what games don't do well. Uh-huh. And it's like all of my games are just not suited for Steam. They just don't do very well. Interesting. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I guess, I guess you have a, a higher ceiling. Like you could do really well if you had a large audience or you know you had a very special type of game. But um, you know, for the most part, mine don't do too well on Steam. But I feel like um, people try to, I don't know, they try to like copy that. You know, it's like they copy that vibe. They, mm. I don't know how to explain it. I don't want to like call out YouTubers, you know, because there I've seen are a, a bunch. few, and I don't want to call them out either. But there's a few, and there's one that they're they're starting to freak me out because they're they're talking about this, like how to make money and how to do this and how to sell your game. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, I know y'all's numbers. Like they've told mm-hmm. me their numbers. And I'm like, Mm -hmm. you shouldn't be giving this advice. You shouldn't be talking about this. I can because I run a full, I I run a full on studio and we've been published. I've actually signed four publishing agreements. So I have four games that have been published. So I know Mm -hmm. how to bring in revenue. I have two Kickstarter campaigns that raised over a hundred thousand dollars. I've hit the steam front page. Mm. I've made plenty of money on steam, Xbox, PlayStation, console, Apple arcade. So I know what I'm talking about. And then they come in and they're trying to like, I sound bitter. I guess I am. I don't know, but it's like it's little, they come in and they, they they come in and they they say I'm going to do what Thomas is doing, but it's it's not it's disingenuous, mm-hmm. and it makes me look disingenuous, you know. So you know, here's a thought. So you know, I mentioned, um, yeah, I've got some game developer friends that we chat a bunch, and I was talking to my friend Thomas Stewart about this, mm-hmm. and um, the theme that we noticed, you know, we were chatting about this the other day. And I noticed this a bunch. A lot of the people that want to do the YouTube thing it, and do the game dev YouTube thing, it's like they don't actually want to be game developers. They want an escape from like mm. their job. Or they, yeah. they want the lifestyle. Yeah. They they want like what you have where you can choose like how you work. For me, for instance, you know, like this is my office. This is you know, the bedroom in our house, right? And, you know, this is where I do my my studio work and I do all my porting and all the stuff here. I got all my dev kits here. But I choose my schedule and, you know, I make YouTube videos when I want to. And I just got to, for me, you know, I'm fully funded on game sales. So it's like, I just got to know, like, all right, I have projections because I got years now of games on PlayStation. So I can kind of look at a game and go, okay, it's going to make around this range to this range and i need it to come out by this time in order to bring in enough revenue to keep going for the next game right yeah um so it's kind of like i have freedom to decide all right am i working on this today uh you know am am i going to take these three days off because my wife has these days off you know it's kind of like a free lifestyle but it's very stressful because you have to be disciplined you have to you know bring in the money and i feel like there's a lot of people that just want that youtube lifestyle and I've seen a bunch, like there's one guy, and I think he's even talked about it because I was watching a bunch of game dev YouTube videos and I've seen so many, some of the channels are kind of small, a few thousand subscribers like mine and they're they're kind of putting out the game dev videos, every advice videos every week, but some of them are kind of big, you know, 50, 60,000 yeah. subscribers, yeah. maybe over 100,000 subscribers. And like one of the guys, I, I just, I'm not gonna call anyone's names, but it's like he had been doing YouTube, he had, they had quit their jobs, for like over two years yeah and they still hadn't shipped the game um and i was thinking <laughs> yeah. like dude like how do you like if you look at that honestly like you haven't shipped the game and if you do ship there's no guarantee that you'll make any money back and even you know like in my head i kind of look at some of these games and think based on my numbers like okay with no publisher with that audience that game might make twenty five thousand dollars. Yep. You know, or or fifty thousand dollars, or something like that. You can just know because you've done it, right? Yeah, and or or less. You know, you might you might have a hard time hitting ten or fifteen. Yeah. You might get lucky and do seventy five, something like that. You know, if it's your first game, you have a YouTube audience. That doesn't guarantee that they buy your game. Um, it just yep. gives you eyes on it. Mm-hmm. But then I'm like, okay, you know, you've been 
with no other income for two years and then it's taking you two years to make this game it, it'll be two years before you do another game like where it's like the math doesn't add up but everyone kind of posts videos like they're an assertive you know topic like they know what they're talking yeah. about kind of thing uh, yeah. i just think it's i just feel like everyone is just I don't want to like harp on anyone because like I don't want to come on the podcast to like roast other YouTubers. Well, we're not like, calling out anybody's not names. I think what we're doing is a it's a yeah. it's a PSA. I mean, I just want everybody listening mm-hmm. to know you need to be careful who you're listening to on YouTube. And I'm not saying listen to me and buy my stuff, but <laughs> <laughs> don't do that. Don't do that. I'm not gonna do that. Yeah. But I'm just gonna yeah. say yeah. if they've shipped multiple games and they make a full time living, and I told you this before you got on the podcast, I said, look, man. You have to be making money off your games full time if you're going to be on this podcast. It's a it's a very very important um, metric metric before I get a guest on because the YouTube game dev space is littered with people who should not be giving advice on the business side. It's one thing to say here's mm-hmm. how to make a game technically. It's another thing to say here's how to make a ton of money, and it's yeah. like that's that's guru crap. And yeah, if you're going to be a guru, guru. if you're going to be a guru, you have to have done it. That's the rule (laughs) in my mind, because I I, wouldn't be able to live with myself, dude, if I was giving all this advice and and it was fake. Yeah, I've kind of just stopped watching game dev YouTubers, to be honest. Like I used to watch a bunch. And the ones that I watched are highly successful. You know, I'm sure you're friends with a lot of them. Like I, yeah, I, I saw, you know, the Choo Choo Charles guy, and you know, you know Jonas Tyroller. Those um, those two right? guys are valid as heck, dude. They've got it dude, in the bag. Like, yes, like those are the people that like I would watch, or you know, like I really like Jonas. I like a lot of his games, but it's like those guys like make games, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, they made a lot of money like, too. Jonas, Jonas, yeah. his game is killing it right now. Oh yeah, yeah. I really like, yeah. But that's a side tangent. I like his the, one of his older games. Yeah, I I followed him for a while. Mm-hmm. Oh, I yeah. haven't played the new one yet. Yeah. Um. But you know, like I used to watch videos like that all the time, and I wanted to be like, and I watched you all the time. You know, ten years ago when I was making really junky videos. You know, <laughs> I'm still not. I'm still not making the best videos. It's like I try to do a little bit more editing. Yeah. But like, I want to be a game developer. Yeah. Not a YouTuber. Yeah. You know. I got and you. It's kind of like. Yeah, so, but I still do YouTube because it's like you, you need to connect to your audience. And I really enjoy connecting with other developers, not just fans, but, you know, fans and yeah. stuff. You know, it's yeah. it's fun when the community is fun. But now it's just kind of switched. And it's like, it's not about the games. It's about the algorithm. It's about clicks. It's about money. Yeah. Yeah. Like, you know, talking about money, talking about success, yeah. that kind of thing. And, like, I, all, my videos, I'm like, oh, you know, here's how much I made on Steam. I, some of my popular videos, mm-hmm. and I'm like, I made 50 bucks. <laughs> you know, and it's, <laughs> and uh, you know, it's like no one talks like that. I mean, it's becoming more popular on Twitter now mm-hmm. to talk about like if you have bombs. And I don't know if you want to go into it a little bit later in the podcast, but it's like I've tried so many things over the years where it's like I've tried weird pricing experiments, weird genres. I just I have an idea. I want to make something. I just do it. Yeah. And I'm like, I don't know if it's going to be successful, but I'm going to see. Yeah. I've had absolute bombs that have made nothing. I've had games that are that you wouldn't just looking at it. You're like, I don't think that that made any money, but mm-hmm. you would be surprised it did. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So it's, you know, I don't know. It's just it's fun to do the YouTube thing, but I'm like, you know, for me, I just kind of like doing the games and stuff. Think, and everyone kind of changed, you know, recently. It's all about the money and all that kind of stuff. Sure. So I kind of stopped watching a lot of people. Right. There's a lot of good people out there still. Um, I don't know if you watch for tutorials and stuff. Like, I don't know if you've seen Code Monkey. Oh, yeah, um, sure, sure. Well, oh, there's, there's two like, completely like the, different. There's there's two completely. There, there, yeah. This is the way YouTube works. Like those guys are great. YouTube yeah. YouTube is you pick a niche and you focus on the niche and you build a business. Mm-hmm. Well, if you want to build a business, you build a business around that niche, okay? And so <clears throat> yeah. There's a reason why this podcast is called the Full-Time Game Dev Podcast, right? It's because my niche is people who want to do this full-time. So yeah. it would be it would be not helpful if my 
if if all I talked about was the technical side and I didn't actually show people the ropes or the roadmap of like, here's how you do make money. And every guest we have on mm-hmm. is about how they make money and how they did this, right? Because that's yeah. so many people listening right now, that's their dream. The problem is, is mm-hmm. that a lot of game dev YouTubers are confused. They're confused about who their target market is, right? Is it gamers or game developers, right? And yeah. so that's right. I, this is sort of a big PSA for everybody listening. Thomas's brand is not the brand on YouTube. Thomas's brand is not what people should be doing for the most part because they're not educators, right? They don't want to be educators. They want to make games, yeah. right? And they want to sell yep, games. Exactly. And so don't yep. try and replicate my model because I don't care about views. I don't care about subscribers. I care about educational content that really helps hmm. people. And maybe one day, maybe one day they'll want to learn more from me with a product, okay? That's mm-hmm. that's my business on YouTube. That I, I don't I gotcha. I rarely if ever promote my games or do some kind of wish list below for my games. That that's not what YouTube yeah. is for me, right? Whereas for yeah. let's say Thomas Stewart, it's and for you it's probably like how can I get some wish lists out of this, right? And so yep. it's two totally different models, two totally different algorithms, and people need to pick: do they want to focus on gamers or do they want to focus on developers? And so I'm, I'm moving in the sort of the Chris Zakowski world for one of my businesses, yep. which is my YouTube channel. That's my business, right? It, that's my target market. Mm-hmm. But over here, to ensure that I'm not, what's, what's the word? A grifter or a snake oil salesman. Yeah, yeah. Over here with Atmos snake Games, oil. my other business, I make yeah. sure that that thing is very profitable and that thing is, yeah, a, yeah. is a well-oiled machine that makes great games and I work with publishers and platforms so that we have a significant amount of income from those games so that mm-hmm. this is not a lie, right? Yeah, yeah. So that's my mm-hmm. that's my big problem with, with game dev YouTube right now is that most people don't have this. They don't have a business, a, a successful game dev studio, right? That mm-hmm. can give them credibility over here. And that bugs me. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. Now, regarding your credibility, I, I wanted to talk about this during the podcast. It's it's I want to get advice from you, honestly, because I, yeah. I am I right that Thomas Stewart learned from you about how like the value of console and the value of small games. Yeah. Okay. Because yeah. he, he was uh, te- he was telling yeah. me about it on the previous podcast about how he's focused on small console games, and in my head I yeah. was like, that's a terrible idea. But, I remember you saying that, and I was like, bro, no. no I was no, like, no. just tell and, him. Tell him it's great, dude. Tell to him. set this up, though, yeah. to set this up, I, yeah. I I have two. I have a video dropping on Friday, so in four days, uh-huh. and I also dropped a video last week, and it's it's this, like my brain's popping, where I'm like, oh, mm-hmm. the economy sucks, and publishers yeah. don't have nearly as much money, and platforms aren't paying out like they used to. It's, and believe me, they paid yep. out crazy numbers. To, for, for mm-hmm. Never Song. But yeah. now what I'm learning is game devs, because of the economy, because of the game dev industry or the gaming industry being kind of something's off right now, like the money's not there. Oh, yeah. mm-hmm. Now I'm going small games, low budgets, low risk. Uh, you don't go all in with a game. You just You just have a decent hand and you do a small game. So that's your strategy, right? Yes. Get yeah, it. I can talk all about that. I want to hear about and it. It's like, not that it was my forced strategy, but like in the beginning. So like, you know, it's crazy because I'm like, to me, I'm like, oh, I've had so much growth because like back when I released like the letter and stuff, I had like a hundred subscribers on YouTube and now I'm at like 2000. So I'm like, let's go, you know? <laughs> yeah. I, I'm like, it's, it's getting there. Yeah. Dude. Um, uh, and just like you know, my marketing strategy is basically Twitter and YouTube and then Discord. I have a Discord. That's it. Um, and those are like the places I go and I don't really do anything else. But I basically learned early on that, okay, you know, I'm not making money from videos and basically I'm, they're not blowing up, right? My videos, yeah. I, I talk about my games like, yo, this is super cool. Like, here's my new idea that I just found out. Yeah. Here's what we're trying to work on this week. You know, here's a devlog. This is how I did it, you know, in Unity or whatever. And um, I'm super pumped about this. And then I'm like, I've got my core audience that are also pumped about it. You know, if I make, I've kind of split my, I'll talk about it, my, like, honed in strategy in a little bit because it's kind of about managing IP and like uh, building sequels and stuff. 
Um, and I'll, I'll go on to that after the, the base part of the console sales. But I basically learned early on that like I wasn't gonna get a bunch of views and I wasn't gonna convert those views into wish lists. So then I wasn't just gonna sell a huge amount. So it didn't really make sense. Like I have these dream games on my head, right? That I'm like, okay, realistically, this game would take two years to three years of dev time. Mm -hmm. You know, I've done a couple of games with small teams like contract workers in the past, but like right now I'm doing everything solo. And like, I mean everything, game design, programming, 3D modeling, the texture, I write the music, I do all the business side, I do all the porting to all the consoles, everything myself. So I only have to pay myself, you know? Yep, And I love it. I, so, so that's the benefit of doing like real small solo dev. So I'm like, I can't, I spent a few years, like when I was doing the part-time college, part-time work stuff where I'm like, all right, I'm gonna spend a year on this game. One of my games, you know, I spent like a year on, it's called the Perplexing Orb 2. My Orb series is kind of like a Super Monkey Ball. Mm -hmm. um, they're like Super Monkey Ball inspired games, but instead of the level rolling, you just, it's like a physics based platform where you sure. roll the ball. And instead of going through like a, a goal, you know, at the end, there's like a physics post and you have to like hit it just right to knock it down to beat the level. I see. And um, that's one of my more popular franchises. It's just like a, you know, it's like a fun arcade game. Mm -hmm. That's all it is, really. Mm -hmm. And um, like I spent a year on the second game for that, and like it did perform pretty well. But I'm like, is that a year's income? No, not really. And then I kind of realized like, okay, you know, all my games are making a range of like this much to this much, and basically for me to stay full time, at minimum I just have to release like two games a year, mm -hmm. and uh, because I make so much money. Not, not like so much, but like I make a an amount of money like every month, like almost guaranteed because of my back catalog of games I that will that. sell. I love that. And so like I can kind of say, all right, this is the baseline. And this these two releases, like one every six months will be this month where there's a bunch of money and then this month where there's a bunch of money. Yeah. And then with this baseline, that's a year's salary. Yep. And for the most part, in case a game might, you know, plummet or fail a little bit, I shoot for like two to four games a year. Mm -hmm. So it's almost once a quarter. It sounds crazy. It might sound crazy to you because I, I know you've been working well, on your game for like three years. It's because the games that, okay, side, side note, a lot of game yeah. developers listening right now, including me, we tr treat our games like they're our babies and we treat them with this yep. high, high amount of integrity. And by the way, I'm not saying mm -hmm. you don't have integrity. Don't 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 misconstrue oh, yeah, yeah. that. I got you. Even dude. though that's basically what yeah. I just said. What I mean, <laughs> what no, I mean is, okay. there's this high level of like artistry that's like this thing has to be mm -hmm. perfect and it has to change the world and it has to make a million bucks, mm -hmm. right? And in, I'm guessing yeah. in your mind you're like, no, it just needs to be one and done. See you later. Bring in, bring me some revenue. Let's move on, right? Sort of. Um, and I guess I can go a little bit farther. I do want to talk about the difference between console and Steam because I think Please it do. will be really beneficial for um, you know most of the people who are watching because no one really talks about it, and I got a, a bunch of reasons why Steam might be the best platform for you know like established game developers, mm -hmm. but for someone starting out, it's not going to find you as much success statistically speaking compared right. to console. Right. Um, but so I don't do one and dones. So basically, like if you look at my game catalog. I actually, I don't know what kind of games you like to play. Um, this could go on another side tangent because I feel like a lot of game developers don't even play games. I don't. Uh, especially the, yeah, especially the YouTuber <laughs> ones. I got three kids. It's so. like, <laughs> oh yeah, I, I mean like before that. Oh, yeah. I mean, like, um, but before that, no, I, I, I didn't. Oh, and that's so. a big problem because you can, it reflects in my gameplay. My gameplay is very rudimentary. Oh, so. so I know that. I know it's a problem. Um, Sorry, you Sorry, you kind of fuzzed out there for a second. I think oh, that's the internet right. dropped. No, I was saying, can you hear me okay? Um, yeah, I got you now. Okay, I was just gonna say that I, growing up, I didn't really play games. I just watched my brothers play them, and and even oh, okay. that, even now, I don't really play them. And um, I got you. It's it's not a good thing. Like it's not a good thing because my yeah. gameplay really suffers in my games, um, admittedly. So yeah. Yeah, I was just going to say that because it just feels like a lot of people, um, 
it feels like they want to make games, but they don't actually have games that they're inspired by, or yeah. like they they like games, or they don't like video games. So basically, you know, I was gonna say I just have video games that I like, you yeah. know, growing up playing, and like I I kind of want to make games that are you know in similar genres, sure. that type of thing. Um, and so by saying all that, I just kind of looked at Nintendo. Like Nintendo mm-hmm. was like who I wanted to be like. And I'm like in my bedroom by myself and I'm like, I'm just gonna treat Treefall Studios like it's Nintendo. <laughs> and I like I, I would just I would just go out and I would make videos. I mean, if you look on my channel, I mean it's a lot of it's cringe now, but it's like it's so bad. Cause like in 2014, like I would post E3 conference videos and I would be like, here's the four games I'm working on and treat it like yeah. I was Nintendo directing it, you know? And I, I still do that. Um I have a lot of fun doing it. And like, so I would watch them. I'd be like, I don't want to do what other indies are doing. You know, I would watch your channel, like Jonas channel, all these other people. And I'd be like, I'm just going to pretend I'm going to be like Nintendo. Yeah. So I would release like a franchise and then, you know, I would go to a different franchise and then go to a different one. And then like, I have a release calendar basically like in my head planned out for like the next two years. Like I know, like what games I'm gonna be doing for like the next like eight games. Are you gonna su- and I'm be like, supporting okay. previous games? Yeah. So it's like after I'm like, okay, so this game is now old enough to where like it's time to make the sequel for this game. I see. And yeah, then, yeah, yeah. So, so like my three pillars of my three most pr- profitable or you know fan enjoyed franchises i've got a puzzle game series called tilting tiles Mm -hmm. and it's like a minimalist puzzle game where you're basically literally a tile and you're on these towers it's like minimalist clean art yeah there's just like these towers in the sky Mm -hmm. and there's just items all over this there's gems all over the stage and each level you have a move limit and it's basically like a train um like movement based game you have to like analyze it's like planning routes Mm -hmm. you have to like just plan your route through the level and try to get every item before your move limit runs out and then it it gets kind of deep um it's pretty hard for a lot some people because it's like you have special moves that like you can cross multiple spaces Mm -hmm. like you can diagonal or double jump and stuff like that um in order and use one move and there's like teleports and ice and you know bridges that uh flying platforms and skinny hallways and all this different stuff uh, that changes up the gameplay and stuff so there's like one series a puzzle series and then i've got another puzzle series called maze and it's literally like imagine you're a first person shooter game with no gun and you're dropped in giant 3d mazes and you just have to solve your way out brilliant that's it yeah it's it's kind of like you know you're looking at the back of the cereal box and uh, all those mazes you saw as a kid, mm-hmm. I used to draw that. Um, it's, it's, I mean, it's like um, a childhood thing. But like, you know, when I grew up in church and I was like five, it was kind of hard for me to like sit still in that yeah. kind of thing. Yeah. And like my mom would give me like a mint and a little pad. And like me and my friends would draw mazes yeah. in church. I would do the same thing. Uh, me and my brothers used to draw he, mazes all the time. Yeah. yeah. Ex- we would draw exactly. maps for so games then, like, as well. But yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So I just took like that childhood thing mm-hmm. and turned it into a game franchise. So I've got two games in that franchise and a third one about to come out. And then my other popular one is my Super Monkey Ball like game, the, the orb games I was talking about. Yep. And basically what I do is in order to stay profitable, for instance, like I will build upon like a code base that I already have. So it's like, but I won't beat you over the head with it. So like I'll release a tilting tiles game. So you get a new game in the franchise, but I'm not just one and done. I'm not starting from scratch. I'll make a new one. Yeah. I'll make a new one in the future, but I don't make four tilting tiles games in a row. Now, you know, for instance, like, I don't know when this podcast is going to go live, but uh, from the time of recording last week, I just released a new game called the perplexing orb bounce challenge. All right. Links in the description. My, this is my fourth perplexing orb game. Mm-hmm. Okay, so it just came out on PlayStation 4, PlayStation 5. That's where it launched day one. Nice. And now, after I'm done with that, I've already just switched into working on another Tilting Tiles game, right? And the game before that game was actually a word search game. And yeah. I'm going to be doing another one of those. Mm-hmm. So it's like I have a, a, a bunch of franchises 
And like I start building the IP, I start building characters, you know, it builds the world. Uh, when I release Treefall Studios games, a lot of them have Easter eggs to other games, yeah. that kind of thing. So they all kind of cohese together. Thinking like back towards Nintendo, it's kind of like Smash Brothers. Like I treat my own games like they're all going to get together in Smash Brothers, like the Treefall Studios universe. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. And so because starting a brand new game would take a lot longer, I don't just make a sequel. I, I actually, you know, implement a new gameplay mechanic or a new hook or something like that every time I do a Tilting Tiles game. Like, there's a new oh, puzzle mechanic. Is it called Tilting it's, Tiles it's built... 2 or is it a new game? No, see, okay, my, my naming conventions are kind of bad. So I don't like to jump all the way to two yeah i do like what i call spin-offs yeah, yeah so yeah. like i came out with i came out with tilting tiles in 2021 and then in 2022 at the end of the year i came out with tilting tiles ultimate tilt remix which is like a remixed version mm -hmm. um all based around tilting um for the second one and then in 2023 i came out with a third game which is called micro challenge mm -hmm. which is based on shrinking and growing yeah um so it's like it changes the puzzle mechanic. The same b base gameplay is yep. there, but it changes it up. Mm -hmm. um, but they're not called two, so they're all like subtitled. Mm -hmm. And then it's what I consider to be series one um, for the puzzle series. And then eventually when there's a giant change in like how the game is played, then I will go to what is called Tilting Tiles 2. You gotcha. know what I mean? Gotcha. I I do the same thing for my orbs and my maze. Like, the mm -hmm. first maze game is called Maze, just Maze. It's available on PlayStation, Steam, everywhere, basically. Nice. The second one is called Maze Pestle of Trials. So, like, if you don't follow Treefall Studios, like, you wouldn't know that that is Maze 2. It's just, it just has a subtitle. So, like, my marketing is kind of bad sometimes because, like, people just don't know. Yeah. They might just find it for the first time. You know what I mean? Um, but... Basically, I just do spinoffs of, you know, the original game. Yep. And then I just keep building in and out of the franchises. That way I can continually release games, at least two, three a year, you okay. know. But I don't do them in a row. You know what I mean? I love this. Okay, so I'm going to pull up a chat I have right now on Discord. Okay. With, All right. Um, I'm talking to Edmund McMillan right now. He's the creator of, I'm name, oh, yeah. I'm name dropping right now. I'm talking to Edmund McMillan right now, and I've mentioned this quote several times in my videos, but what he uh -huh. said was, he said in response to the indie game industry being really difficult right now and completely flooded, he yeah. said, he said, the only solution we have is to make better games, design always wins. You can make a very, listen to this, you can make a very simple design, that by design he yeah. means a simple gimmick or mechanic, that shines yeah. very bright gameplay wise. Um, yeah. And I think that that in combination with hang tight, I'm going to, I've got a conversation right now with Thomas Sala or Tomas Sala and he made a game called. Oh, that guy's cool. Yeah. He's awesome. He made a game. He's back in your Chronicles uh -huh. bulwark. That's, that's right. Yeah. And he gave me this long message about how to survive in the game industry in 2025. <laughs> And he nice. said exactly what you just said. And I won't really? read the whole thing, but all he really yeah, said cool. was he's building a brand or a franchise that is yes. niche. It's a small audience, but he reuses yep. his code base yep. and he reuses his projects mm -hmm. to create derivatives. Um, yep. And by the way, to their credit, but also I hate what they're doing. Disney is doing this. They take their IPs oh, yeah. and they just, I'm about to swear. Well, I won't swear in the pot. They, they S them out, yeah. right? Now I'm not yeah. saying that's what you're doing, but I'm saying that there is a strategy there. And that is, yes. how, how do we get these games out quicker so, and yep. not constantly go all in with every game, right? And start with a completely fresh yeah. new hand, but rather yep. build your hand and change your hand yeah. so that all of a sudden you go yep. from a, I don't know, two aces to a royal flush over time. Exactly. Exactly. I love that. And, and see, I, 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 my, my, my mind is just so, it's just spinning right now because I'm like, it makes really? so much, oh yeah, it makes so yeah. much sense. 
And I have a yeah, coach. See, right, I have a coach right now that that I, I, I hired to help me sort of reframe the way I'm thinking about business. And oh, yeah. he's helping me learn that most businesses, including game devs, they have a ton of bloat because of the way they think. They're thinking, oh, I got to scale oh, yeah. up and I got to go huge and I got to make these huge games, right? And mm-hmm. they always quit. They always quit because it's just too big, right? It's, it's and what you're hard. doing is, what you're doing is saying, no, I'm going to stay small. And I don't need to blow my budget, and I don't need to spend two years on a game. I need to make a small oh, game, no. release it, and then build on that IP yep. or build on that framework that's yeah. built from scratch. But and then you know, a year down the road, it's not yeah. from scratch, right? Yep, exactly. Brilliant. See, because I mean, like, what when I say from scratch, like I, I'm not one that like I don't use any assets. You know, everything is like handmade, mm-hmm. and I'm kind of like, I'm just like I would say. You know, to encourage people, it's like I'm very, not that I'm average, but it's like I don't, I'm not a super talented artist, right? So it's like I'm, I'm working and like each project that I do, I try to polish it. I look at other people's projects, I look at my past work, try to polish it up a little bit better, you know, do, make the whole experience just a little bit better each time. Mm-hmm. But I'm not like, like you're saying, obsessing you know, constantly over all of the little details. I'm like, I'm just like adding to my skills each time I release. And the beating over your head thing is really, really important. Like if I just released like, you know, orb one, orb two, orb three, orb four in two years, like you could become known for that just one thing, but I just don't want to do that. I don't think that they would keep selling. You know what I mean? Yeah. I. It's like important to switch the games in and out, and that gives you like sanity because, you know, like if you're just c- like creating the same thing over and over and over, it's kind of like not mind numbing, but like eventually you'd be like tired of it. You're living mm-hmm. in the same exact little world, you know. And like I like to change it up, and like I feel like you learn more that way. Like mm-hmm. for instance, you know, like in 2022 maybe, like in the middle of all of these games, I just released this game called Mighty Math which is literally just an arcade game where you're like a square. Mm -hmm. And all you have to do is keep your, like you have a number value inside the square. You have nine squares. So it's like a grid of like three, three, three. Mm -hmm. And like every time there's just numbers that fly across the screen at you. And every time you grab one, it changes the value of your player. And you can't go below zero and you can't go above nine. So basically what happens is there's just a bunch of numbers that just keep getting thrown at you, thrown at you, thrown at you. And it's an endless game. It has in it's programmed to be endless and it's just a high score driven game. Right. And basically they get faster and the numbers spin and bounce and all this kind of stuff um, to where like you're trying to do math in your head. You're Mm -hmm. trying to figure out what numbers you need to pick up and what numbers you need to dodge in order to live because you have to get a certain number of numbers to survive each round basically okay so um so basically go ahead go ahead so basically like i just will be like doing these franchises that i'm building and like building sequels but then randomly i'll be like okay let's do something completely different i don't know if it's gonna have an audience this is kind of fun to me and i do a project that there's something about it that i didn't know in my head like how to program yes um And I will like use that project to figure it out Mm -hmm. and then take that knowledge from that project into like the next sequel of something else to make something a little bit better in that game. You know what I mean? Oh yeah. Like just like just shoving stuff in, like just going out there. So not everything is a franchise. I just do drop like random projects, you know, like I have a game, like a word search game, right? That is like literally it's just a casual word search game. You just complete one two word search um and i just released it on playstation a couple of months ago how do you and so is it, like do that, you spell out one and then you spell out i'm looking it up right now it's um, just like it's like the number one dash number two dash word search and it's literally just a grid it's like a word search game right and you just have all sorts of categories and it just has a timer and it's got different oh background goodness. themes and so what i did was you know to tie it into tree fall games I put a tree fall radio in the bottom and all the background music is from all of our other games. Yeah. And you unlock new background music every single time you beat a word search uh-huh, and uh-huh. you can switch it. So it's like, 
it, it's like almost like you can feel the cohesiveness like of all of the games, even if it doesn't have anything to do with our other games. Yeah. Even if it's just a word search. But the whole reason I made that game was just like I learned how to do like some a better way to do grids and like basically like coordinate placing and stuff, mm -hmm. which I might take to use in like a you know a city builder game type of thing. It's like I was, you know, uh, it's just it was just another programming challenge that changed the way. I was thinking like I was programming physics in orb beforehand and I'm like, well, here's a casual game, you know, that it's just a game. Yep. It's just a fun game. It's just, you just do word searches, but like I used it to learn something new and it like made it fun for me. You know what I mean? Oh yeah. You know, I, I'm, I'm thinking in my head is just thinking about the strategy here and, and why it's brilliant. Um, okay. So it's almost like, Okay, let me try and phrase this correctly. You know how itch.io is Go filled with just a bunch of concept games? Yep. And none of them are fully complete, and they're just based on like a small little gimmick, or there's just a tiny little, and they're super niche, right? It sounds like yeah. what you figured out how to do is, number one, you create that small gimmick, uh, and then mm -hmm. you just make sure it's tight. And that it's 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 mm -hmm. it's packaged cleanly, and so it's not like a lot of these concept games. They end after twenty minutes, or the yeah. loop doesn't continue to get more and more challenging. So it's just boring after like five minutes. Mm -hmm. And I've been yeah. there. Like I made a game called, well, I stole a game. Uh, I made a game called Flash Geometry Wars. It was Geometry Wars, but I made it in Flash. Right. Oh, nice. And that was nice. like one of my first games when I was like seventeen. Right. I didn't know nice, that it was nice. illegal to do that. <laughs> So, because Geometry Wars was a very strong yeah. IP at that at, 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 in 2000, when, 2008 or nine. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. But anyway, I did that, and the problem was I got it working for like the first three minutes. But after the first three minutes of gameplay, the loop just completely collapsed, right? But you've mm -hmm. created a loop that doesn't collapse, and it's it's just fun to keep playing and playing and playing, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. So you've got this this business model where it's like it's like a flash game or it's like an itch.io game, but it's it's finely tuned and it's actually you can actually play it for a, a longer period of time is that correct well most of my games they're small so i would say you can beat like my story driven games like or yes, or, yes. or mate like those games you can beat them in like an hour to three hour sitting usually okay. the the tilting tiles games maybe two hours average to mm -hmm. five plus hours depending on which game it is yeah. you know of puzzle time i have a couple endless games like the mighty math one is endless so it's it's like run based and it's like there's randomization to it and stuff so you could play it for theoretically as long as you wanted mm -hmm. to chase high scores and stuff um i've got a couple of games like that yeah uh so they, there are some endless games but most of my games are like an hour to three mm -hmm. hours experience to okay. be okay and they're they're some all like five of, bucks of, right yeah, all my games are priced between one ninety nine and nine ninety nine. Okay. So I've done a, I've done a a bunch of pricing um stuff just to try different things. I even so much like I lost money in order just to see if it would work. Like um my micro challenge, my tilting tiles micro challenge. Yeah. I charged forty nine cents for it, even though it's worth way more than that. And it was like a pun because I was like, the game is micro yeah. because it's a smaller game yeah. and you shrink the character in that game and I'm going to charge nothing for it. Because I was thinking I like, that. okay, let's, tr I was like, okay, let's try and see if we can sell, you know, just hundreds and hundreds of thousands of copies at like nothing and introduce all those people to the other games yep. because they're, they, they played the same way. It didn't work out, by the way. Don't do that. Don't uh, <laughs> don't charge. There's 99 a balance cents. between oh. you know high price, low price. Yeah. You got to find that exact optimum exactly. number for high the highest. But basically, yeah. But basically, I've tried that on my own mm -hmm. without looking at other people's data. And you know, out of my top three selling games, it's very interesting. My top my highest revenue grocers. It's like one of the games is five ninety nine. One of them is nine ninety nine. And one of them is two ninety nine. Mm -hmm. So it's like the two ninety nine is like right at the top. It grosses more than some of the nine ninety nine ones. Yeah. So there is a balance to where it's like sometimes, even though it's a lot cheaper, you might just sell way more. 
gotcha. like what enough more to where like the actual revenue is more than you know the bigger games i would say that there's some kind of balance around the 499 mm-hmm. you know 599 range it's kind of like what i shoot at and i've done a lot of 199 stuff where it's like the game is really little and i'm just like all right you know this is about as cheap as you could get um and some of those actually sell like a ton to where like it does make a good amount of money mm-hmm. but you know i kind of think that for me in, in most people like if you're starting off an indie game maybe somewhere between 2.99 and 9.99 would be mm-hmm. like your target in target goal or whatever so i i like to try and turn things into frameworks that people can understand um yeah so tell me if this framework is correct um okay. for your strategy hit me up find a gimmick so in your case, let's think. I'm look, by the way, I'm looking at your games, and they all look really fun, and they're very, very, very thanks, niche. man. They're very niche. Yeah. Um, yeah. Thanks. They all have a very simple gimmick, like maze, for example. Mm-hmm. And and then after I give you the yeah. framework, I want to talk about why most game developers can't do this because they get they have psychological roadblocks, including me. Yeah. So number one, you find a gimmick. Number two, mm-hmm. um, you program and build a game around that simple gimmick. Number three, Uh instead of scaling the gimmick to a unmanageable degree, instead of scaling it, you just tighten the screws, wrap it up and call it a product. It's just tight and simple. Cause I think a lot of game developers and here's the roadblock and that, well, the the next step is find a platform where it'll actually sell because I'm looking at steam. It seems like your games don't do very well on steam. Like, yeah, if I was only looking at steam, I'd say there's no way this guy's making money. Right. Oh, no, no. Yeah. See, th- we'll go into that. after yeah. this. So you found yeah. platforms where they sell well. So that's the, mm-hmm. that's the, the final step. So yeah. is that first off, is that framework correct? Yeah, it's I would say that's pretty close. I don't you know, in my head, I'm like, I don't even call it a gimmick or a hook yeah it's like i'm not even thinking through that much i'm just like what would be fun or i mean well, i guess it is the hook it is, or whatever is, i'm just like you know? yeah i'm just like you know <laughs> oh and like you, have you ever seen that um that venn diagram that indie game developers share where it's like games i can make games i want to make games that have a market and then you have to find the one in the middle yeah you know um where it's like okay a lot of my game design is influenced by what i can make like growing up, yeah. my favorite game, the reason I wanted to become a game developer is Spyro the Dragon, right? On PlayStation 1, PlayStation. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> so like, I always just wanted to make a Spyro the Dragon like game, yeah. you know, a big 3D platforming game, all that kind of stuff. But right now, it's like, I don't have the budget to do that. That'd take too long. Mm-hmm. And it's like, if you think about it, it's like, oh, well, you know, these guys, you know, it's like 100 people working on that you know, for two years in 1998 or whatever. Yeah. Like it's unrealistic to think that, oh, I can do that in six months, right. you know, <laughs> by myself. So it, it's like, it is unrealistic. Okay. You're right. Yeah. So it's like, I got to make a smaller game and then I'll get there eventually. So it's like, okay, I got to make smaller games. What can I make and what do I find interesting and or fun? Yeah. And what will other people maybe find interesting and fun? And that's how I go about it. Now, if you do look at the Steam page, it's kind of interesting. Like I do have a Steam franchise page and you could scroll through. I have like eight of my games on Steam and I've released probably like 15 games on PlayStation, something like that. So only like half of them go to Steam because I just don't even drop some of them on there anymore because it's just not really worth it. Uh, and you can see some of them, like the Maze games, like they have positive review ratings, you know, maybe 14 reviews. Yeah. The letter has like 20 reviews. So a couple of them have hit rating thresholds where it's like, oh, you know, made a thousand dollars, you know, yep. something like that. Yep. And then some of the games that don't sell, it's like, oh, well, you know, I made a hundred dollars off that game on yep. Steam, right? Yep. And then you got to look at the other side of things. It's like, I kind of mentioned this like earlier when we were talking about the podcast, like do game developers play video games? They do, because like I only did what I know because like when I was growing up, I didn't play PC games. You know, I'd never really been on Steam. I'd always played console games. So I was always like, oh, video games is making games for consoles. And like that concept seems like foreign to a lot of game developers online in the game dev space. Um, So I'm like, okay, well, I'll shoot for consoles. Um, 
And I think there's like a few reasons why, like in general, if you have a small audience and you don't have like a huge base of wish lists or you can't like reach out to a lot of people, that consoles are just better in general than Steam. Um, and it's just because number one is like exposure. Like if you look, like I think, I actually wrote this down before we, we started this. Let me see if I can find it. Um, like, okay, so I, I do a lot of Steam research, right? Like in 2023, there was 14,436 games on Steam released. That was last year, right? And you got all these people watching this, you know, we're talking to all, I talk to people on my channel, you talk to people on your channel, all these people want to be full-time game developers. And those people haven't released games yet. So you already have a pool of like 15,000 games you're about to jump into, and you probably have 100 to 1,000 people that you know that want to jump into that pool. You know what I mean? Yep. How are you gonna stand out if you, like if you don't have the money like if you don't have the budget to do, I mean, some people, it just works. I don't know how people are self-funding for years. You know, like for yeah. instance, some people work seven, eight years, like Stardew Valley, you know, you might be able to work on your game for 10 years and then release a game and sell millions and millions. But in my case, it's like, well, I wanted to work on video games, but I don't have 10 years to work on just one single game. Like I don't have like yeah. one idea that, I just want to do for that long, you know what I mean? Yeah. And most people that are trying nowadays, like schedules are so tight, everything is so busy, like doing game dev part time isn't really enough. Like it takes forever to do something. It takes forever to do it full time. You know how long it takes. <laughs> it does. Um, like you could spend years. You got multiple people on your team, and I you're do. spending years on a game, yeah. and it's like. Well, how do you expect someone who doesn't have skills, mm -hmm. who's like starting from scratch, yeah. you know, to do one or two hours a day, just, you know, and they also got to learn and watch YouTube videos, tutorials and things like that to learn Unity. Like, how are they supposed to make a game and put it on Steam in that big ocean of games and make enough money to cover the bills? Like, almost no one does it. I think it's, I don't know what the statistic is, but like, it's like 90% or something. Yeah. Like they don't even make their $100 back. And, and or an they only release one game. An additional piece of data there is that, and this is from Chris Zakowski. He calls it, um, mm. he calls it the sandbox. And yeah. it's basically the majority of indie game developers stay in the sandbox, meaning, and the sandbox is you have less than 10 reviews. And so the metric oh, is yeah, yeah. get past 10 reviews. Do whatever you mm -hmm. can to get past 10 reviews. A buddy of mine actually yeah. just, uh, he launched one of his books. He wrote a book on Amazon and Amazon's the same oh, thing. Cool. It, it looks for, it looks for reviews. So he goes to all of his friends yep. and he's like, Hey, look, can you read my book and then leave a review, please? Like, let's do it day one, yeah. you know? Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. and the same is true with, 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 with steam. So to encourage people listening about steam, cause steam is steam is where I've made, uh, the most in game sales. Um, is Steam and then also Apple actually uh, with Apple Arcade, mm -hmm. but it was a totally different business model because um, it's subscription yeah. based, so you get like payouts from Apple. Um, mm -hmm. Point being though, for, for people who do want to launch on Steam, and I, I do like Steam, so I'm a Steam guy, um, yeah. and I think you can be profitable on Steam. You you have oh, yeah. to go with more high polished, higher pro higher higher value on Steam, in mm -hmm. my opinion, mm -hmm. and build up wish lists, all that. But all that said, for people who want to launch on Steam. The way to avoid being part of that 90% is build up your wish list numbers and get some reviews. Um, mm -hmm. That's really important. So it's not as scary, I think, as people think, because yeah. if you know how to get reviews and you know how to get wish lists, and then you yeah. re release a decent game, you're good. Mm -hmm. And you're automatically yeah. in that 10%. Um, yeah. The problem is most people don't know how to do uh, that. They don't know how to get wish lists. They don't know how to make a higher value game. By higher value, I mean like fifteen bucks. Um, mm -hmm, you know, mm -hmm. it's 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 pretty expensive actually to make a game that has that kind of value. To get it is good good reviews, very positive or mostly positive, and to sell it for yeah. fifteen bucks, it's it's a lot of work. Um, mm -hmm. Whereas I think what you're saying is, don't don't try and hit that market go elsewhere where you can sell a $5 game and, and it's, 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 um, 
it would you say yeah. it's a, would you say it's a mix between mobile and steam it's like somewhere in the middle in terms of the value or the, the quality um, no not really and um i'm not a steam hater you know it's like i kind of it's like it's hard but i just don't think it's just to like put the honesty out there i don't think it's really realistic that people are just going to drop their first game on steam and then you know make a lot oh of money. sure the first it game no way it, it's it takes a lot of time like you know like basically like you said to to be profitable on steam you can make the most money on there but it's like you have to have reviews you have to have wish lists mm -hmm. and a lot of times like even chris is teaching you know materials and stuff is like oh you you launch like maybe two years early and you like build up yeah. wish lists oh, and yeah. you do you do the steam next fests and you do your dev logs and you go to events and you do all this stuff to build wish list and i'm kind of talking to like you know if you don't have the time to do that like you know it's going to that like if you don't have funding to do that for two years right and you you want to spend six months making a game like most likely if you spend six months and you put a game on steam like you're not going to make a thousand dollars you know what i mean i totally unless agree. the game unless it's like really good or unless, unless it's like something just special or you're just um, you're a very you're a very talented developer who's who's who knows the ropes and yeah. this this might sound this is going to sound egotistical, but I could do that. <laughs> if I wanted to, I could release yeah. a, a $10 game on Steam in six months and probably yeah. have it make 30 grand minimum just because I just know the ropes. Yeah. And I also, I, I yeah. can do the artwork and I can do the music and I, I can create a yeah. pretty cool atmosphere and atmosphere for my games is what sells them. Um, yep. So I, I could do it, but I don't pretend to think that everybody listening right now has been there and done it and they have the experience to do it quickly yeah. right yeah so you're right so the reason why i think the reason why consoles it's a little bit easier because you know there's a lot of active users because i'm like a big proponent of like oh ship on playstation 4 and playstation 5 a lot of indies like i don't understand they're just shipping on playstation 5 now and uh you know like the the new the new gens because you know playstation 4 is kind of old but like just recently sony put out their numbers and yeah. half of their user base like 55 million people are still actively using ps4 uh -huh. so they have like about 100 last month i think it was 116 million active users right so you got th the difference between consoles and steam is like steam has a low barrier to entry you know it's a hundred dollars to get on there and they'll basically let any developer, you don't have to have a company, you don't have to have any of that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. You can just launch right on Steam. Right. It's easy, you can just figure it out. But that's why there's a ton of people. If you don't have a lot of eyes on your games on YouTube and stuff like that, you're gonna get more natural eyes viewing your game on these other storefronts because there's less competition. Gotcha. And there's a, ton of, there's a ton of games launching on PlayStation now, there's a ton of games launching on Switch, but like, there might be 20 to 30 games launching a week on those systems. Yeah. But there's like 40 games launching a day on Steam, right? Yep. Like on Steam, you might only have a few hours on that new release. And if you don't hit the front page, you're toast. Unless right. you can bring in external traffic to your games. Okay. On console, you might have two weeks and still be very visible on the front page. There's a higher barrier to entry to consoles because it costs more. Uh, mm -hmm, because, mm -hmm. you know, I can't really talk about it um, specifically, but everyone knows, like, there's dev kit costs. It's under NDA on what they all cost. Um, you know, you can pretty much Google those, and someone's leaked it somewhere yeah. or gotten close. But, you know, it's the ballpark of, you know, usually four-ish figures for dev kits, right? Let's just say that. Yeah. So you got to pay out of pocket for dev kits. It takes there's like a longer certification process there's more you got to do um so you got to learn how to ship on that specific console so yeah. there's a little bit of time involved in there so there's a little bit of higher barrier and barrier to entry but you can get more natural eyes on your game yeah i also think it's easier to develop for to be honest because you're not like it's just like it's simple like you only have like one skew or two skews you just make the game and then you just you just do it like on on the pc you might have to think okay like what if someone has low specs or uh, you know you, you change the resolution all this stuff so you're worried worried about building all these options into your game so mm -hmm. people can play you know all this kind of stuff 
Well, on PlayStation, in, in, in the way that I'm shipping games quickly, you know, I've learned the process. Like, I've got it down. Like, I could do it in my sleep. I could do their certification in my sleep. I know exactly how long to do all the back-end stuff, when to do it. Because, you know, they have a bunch of things that, like, when a new developer gets onto their site, they have five or six different back-end sites, and they've got a bunch of different setup, and it's very confusing, and you got to read a lot of documentation. But once you learn it, you can streamline it very easily. And then it's like, I'm only basically developing for this one SKU. It's like this exact hardware set. I don't have to worry about options. I just make the game run 60 FPS. You know, as long as it's 1080, 60 FPS, the game is good to ship. And then from there, I will just take that PlayStation port and then just port it to Steam. Like I don't build mm. PC first. I build, I build the PlayStation one and then I just add like mouse controls keyboard controls because i find it annoying to have to do steam because like oh you're programming for a keyboard and a mouse you gotta do programming inputs to switch to a controller you gotta switch the ui you know all this yep. kind of stuff yep. i'm like something on playstation is so simple because your ui is just a, f a couple button symbols you know it's the same if you're only doing like a single platform mm -hmm. you can speed your process up so fast recently I just ported tilting tiles to the Xbox One and Xbox Series X. It's playable. On, it's an Xbox One version, but it's playable on both of them. Yep. It came out last month, and um, like that process took so so long, uh -huh. right? Because I had I had to learn all that stuff again. I I not again. I've never done it before. Like, you know, I have the PlayStation stuff streamlined, so it's like I was learning it all again for the Xbox gotcha. and having to switch out the UI learning how to do their achievements, how to do their cloud saves, how to do like the things that are required for Xbox, all yeah. that kind of thing, how to build their store pages. You know how like people optimize your Steam store page? Well, you have to learn how to do that for Xbox and PlayStation or Switch or whatever. And like I felt like for me, a lot of people want to go like all platforms, like Xbox, PlayStation, Steam, Switch, you know, mobile even, like one of the strategies a lot of publishers are doing is get it everywhere and get as much revenue as possible. Yeah. But for me, speed is my strategy. I can so tell you, by the way, that, I... that publishers are, some publishers I know are abandoning that yeah. strategy. So the, the sim, the they sim are. ship standard, they're getting rid of it. Uh -huh. And actually they're, they're, they're focusing on steam. It's, it depends on the IP, right? If the IP is yeah. a high quality, high value, 15, $20, up to uh -huh. 50 or 60 and it's a high uh -huh. quality game like high polished right they'll go yep. steam first because they know they can probably hit you know that t top 10 percent right of games being mm -hmm. launched but then they determine from steam if it's going to be valuable on console the reason why they're doing it backwards yeah is because for high fidelity games it's actually it's easier uh -huh. to build for, for for pc lower fidelity yep. like super simple mm -hmm. graphics it's so much easier to build on console. So it costs mm -hmm. upwards of, I mean, it could cost 60 grand, it could cost 100 grand just to port to console with a game like yeah. Twisted Tower, right? Because well, see, it's gonna cause the, the the Nintendo Switch to explode if we port it to Switch right now, you know? Um, yeah, well, Switch, that, that's, that's a whole different league of porting. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, like, for instance, game developers back in the day, like let's talk Xbox 360, um, PS3 era. Mm -hmm. Like back then, like you developed for consoles first. And then it started shifting in the PS4, Xbox One, where it's like the PC was getting developed first. And back in the day, like you used to have like console versions as your standard. And now people, it's easier, like you said, it's cheaper on Steam because you can just throw whatever out there. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yep. And like you, you're not like you're not benchmarking for that one skew anymore, right, you know. Right. Well, I've written um, down two two diagrams here, based on what you've said, because I'm trying to. I, I again, I like to try and bring this stuff down to a simple framework. Uh, let's see here. You, maybe you can't read this, but I'm going to put it up there for my audience to read. And if you're listening to this on the podcast, the first diagram is number one. It says 100% of your effort goes into the game, and that's Steam. Whereas number two, which is console, 60% of your effort goes into the game, 40% goes into understanding porting and the certification process. 
The reason I wrote that down is because most game developers will avoid number two because they don't want to deal with understanding the port. And so that's the barrier yeah. of entry that you're talking about, yeah. which is a certain yeah. amount of your effort, a good, especially new console developers, they're going to have to mm -hmm. figure all that out and they don't want to do that. It's hard. And so it's, they'd rather really put hard. all of their effort into the game itself and then just launch it on Steam. Well, the problem with that yeah. is that, like you said, they're jumping into this huge pool of all these, including me, like a lazier mindset or like a mindset that's like, well, I want to avoid the pain of understanding certification and, and porting. And so they, mm -hmm. they all jump into the same pool, right? And so what mm -hmm. I think what, what you figured out how to do is that 100% of your effort can now go to the game because only, well, 99% of your effort can go toward the game yes. and 1% can go towards yeah. porting because you understand it so well, right? That's what I was going to say. Like, it, for going back to the Xbox thing, you know, you're saying publishers are dropping that all-platform method. Mm -hmm. And I'm kind of doing that too because, like, in my opinion like from what i've seen so far from the xbox sales like it's not the worst right mm -hmm. but in my opinion it would be faster and more profitable for me to stay on just the playstation because it's quicker and easier and mm -hmm. i'm more efficient at it yep. instead of wasting time doing you know other ports okay. just to get a little bit of extra revenue it'd be quicker just to go ahead and do the next game yep. and make more money right so i'm trying to figure out how to streamline you know I also release on the Atari VCS, which is like highly niche. And um, I basically at this point, I'm going to just do Steam and like VCS ports, like, you know, like on the side. Like, yeah. I basically develop a game for a PlayStation and then I just port for PC. And then, like, the Atari thing, um, that's super easy. Like, that porting process can be done in like a day or two mm -hmm. if you already have like a, a working game. And it's, it's kind of, for the for the amount of effort that it takes it's it's worth the 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 income for me um but yeah so it's mostly just you know just streamlining the playstation releases you know what i mean i got you you know to to sort of wrap up this conversation so much has been learned i have this diagram here and it, it's a maze and so this is a nice little <laughs> bookend to end on because let's go mis you love mazes i've drawn this That's diagram right. here which it's that's on oh, Steam. Beautiful. That's that's the hedge maze, and all the developers uh -huh. are in it. Okay, and there's mm -hmm. you, that little die, and that's you've yep. exited the hedge maze, and you found yep. the shortcut to to full time income. Which is why am I gonna play in this hedge maze and try and find my way to the money? Let's say there's a treasure chest in the middle of it that people are looking for. <laughs> when in reality, you can yeah. just say, "I'm getting out of this hedge maze. This is ridiculous." Now. Yeah. To be able to get out of the hedge maze and enter the console world, you've got to build a yeah. ladder and get out of that hedge maze. And it, it requires work to craft the ladder. And that is, I'm going with the metaphor here, the, the yeah. ladder is learning console. It's tough. Yeah. And believe me, I've, I've, I've done two console ports. The, well, I've participated yeah. in two. And uh -huh. the reason I say that is because as the reason I say I participated is because I didn't do the full thing because it's brutal. Now mm. it's not brutal. Nah, it man, sounds it's like it's easy. not brutal for you because it's you're you're building yeah. for console to begin with, and so you 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 focus yep. on a lower fidelity. By fidelity, I mean you're just mm. not using, you know, mega scans and real time, you oh, know, yeah. RTX lighting or whatever. I don't know. Um, yeah, so. you just gotta keep in mind like actual old optimization tips. Like you can't just throw it all into yeah. Unity and be like, it's gonna run, you know. <laughs> well, dude, this I was mean, the so PlayStation good. Five is pretty good, but still, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, this was so helpful. It's wild to me because yeah. I'm thinking about like my my training material that I offer and also the stuff I teach on YouTube, mm -hmm. and I'm like so excited mm -hmm. because this is a whole new paradigm for me. And um, interesting. I, I, for real, like I, I want to dip my toes in it and start seeing how it works. Um, yeah. And uh, so console, much, bro. so much has been learned here today. This has been awesome. Yeah. Um, everybody check out nice. Treefall Studios below. Um, Sweet. There's a link. I, we'll, we'll include some kind of link, maybe a link to your, your games page or something. Um, and, yeah, or yeah. Your YouTube Just channel. The, yeah. Sure. Do I a little plug on the way out, I guess? Yes. Yes, please. 
Sweet. Um, All right. Well, if you guys enjoyed our chat, you can find me on YouTube at Treefall Studios. Uh, I, I also have a Discord you guys can join, or you can yeah. find our games from all of those places. PlayStation so, mostly, but there's some on Steam. So, yeah, Eli. I really appreciate you having me on, man, yeah, dude. dude. This was a great chat. I really appreciate it. It was a whole lot of fun. Well, it's, it's crazy because it's finally, like, sometimes I feel like I would just repeat the same thing over and over on YouTube. And this is uh -huh. such a different perspective. It's so good. And when I had really? Thomas on, which, again, Thomas is your buddy, um, and he yeah. was telling me about Love this. Love that guy. It didn't, he's the it, best. Oh, he's great. It didn't quite make yeah. sense to me, and I'll admit that. Yeah. But now it's just clicking, dude. And it's it's almost like God dude. like put put you guys in my life because there's been a, I've been exhausted by the yeah. going all in for games. Like it's it's brutal. Uh -huh. That the mental stress of making a game over three years and spending hundreds of thousands of dollars and just praying and crossing your fingers that it's gonna do well, that yeah. is so mentally exhausting. And and it's exhausting yeah. for my whole family because like I'll go downstairs sure. at five thirty after work and it's just it's just it's it like the stress and the anxiety of is this gonna work? It's it's there. It's hard and this to is let my go, third huh? game, you know? So Yeah. Yeah. No, I totally understand. It's it, it's kind of hard to break that mental shift because you're kind of always in the work mode. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. But with, but, with yeah, what you're dude, doing, it sounds like it's a simpler life. So, and there's predictability a little there, bit, right? A, a little bit, but it's still stressful because it's like, oh, you know, if this game flops, right? Then it's like I got three months to get the next one out, or, <laughs> or else we're in trouble. <laughs> you know, the, I think it's the goal, just though, like. Is, the goal is to build yeah. up that machine so that it's every game yes. is dripping income. And so even if your yep. next three flop, those previous 12, <laughs> are, they're still, still a drip got, of income. You know, got a little bit. Yeah, yeah, exactly. No, it's pretty good. Um, I'm excited to see your Twisting Tower uh, console release, man. Uh, well, when, you know, when you, that is, on, when you drop it on PlayStation, bro. <laughs> I can't say anything about it. Um, but oh, okay. we did. I, I can say we got it running um, at, oh, at really? a decent frame rate, which was surprising. Um, Sweet, but because uh, consoles, it they they make them look really pretty. Like the hardware looks amazing, uh -huh. but uh -huh. performance isn't great um, of those yeah. things. So, yeah. all right, dude. I hear you. I hear you. All right. Well, let's do this dude. again. This was great. Super informative, dude. Yeah, dude. Right. Had a blast. Eli, guys, really links in the description. It. Check out Eli's stuff, and I'm gonna keep tabs on you, dude. Learning a lot from you. Thanks, dude. Nice man. Yep. Cheers. By the way, if you're like me and you always dreamt of making an indie game as a full-time job, I have a free webinar below that goes into exactly how to make six figures with just a demo. I was just like you for years. I thought I had to make a game in its entirety before getting a paycheck, but there's actually three ways to make six figures before even finishing your game. I've done this multiple times. So check it out below if you do want to go full-time indie. And thanks for watching.